So this is our model of how science is conducted. Each person fits in their seat. Each person's an expert at their instrument. They make classical music. What we're going to talk about is whether that actually is a valid model. This is me. I live in two domains. I live in a hospital. I live in a research lab. At all times, I'm surrounded by magnificently brilliant young people. It's the most wonderful job in the world. This is the EKG of most of my patients, and it shows you what we call tombstone elevation, emblematic of a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. Now, what I wanted to do is, since we're in Washington, start talking about the people who don't have access to healthcare, people who, because of their position, have limited access to great medical care, because it's from these people that we can learn what we shouldn't do. Of course, I'm talking about the presidents of the United States. <laughs> Franklin Roosevelt was incapacitated by angina, by chest pain, and hypertension. Died of a stroke, and many of the decisions he likely made in the end of his third term and the beginning of his fourth term were flawed. Dwight Eisenhower had five or six heart attacks. We lost track, and his physicians in the mid 50s told him to snuggle with his wife. I thought that went out with King David. <laughs> One man broke the mold. One man absorbed all of our technology. That is Vice President Dick Cheney. <laughs> Vice President. <laughs> It used to be said when I was in medical school, if you understood syphilis, you understood all of internal medicine. What I tell my students: study Dick Cheney, and you'll know all of cardiology. So, one of the truly wonderful things, aside from being around brilliant young people, is that in my lifetime as a physician and a clinician scientist, the deaths from cardiovascular disease have dropped sixfold. From 1970 to 2010, there's been a remarkable drop in the incidence of major disease and the mortality from them. If you had a heart attack when you were Dwight Eisenhower's era. You had a 50% chance of not making it to the hospital. If you made it to the hospital, a 50% chance of leaving. And today, the chance of leaving the hospital intact and healthy is 95%. So the question about Dick Cheney is twofold: What took so long from Eisenhower to Cheney? And second, why did one man get so much? <laughs> If it worked, you would have thought we fixed him. So, <laughs> so let me take you on a journey that I went on, a serendipitous journey, a journey that I was enabled to be a part of by virtue of where I was. It was the development of cardiovascular stents, and in that, around that time, I had been educated as an engineer and was emerging as a cardiologist. And I went long before I had these wonderful people surrounding me. And I went to the father of vascular biology, and I said, "I need to study vascular biology. I'm an engineer. I'm a cardiologist." And he said, "This isn't his voice, but it sounds much better when I do it this way." Elazar, <laughs> 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 the dumbest blood vessel is smarter than the smartest vascular biologist. I said, "I know that. That's why I'm here." He said, "No, no, no. Let me finish." Said, okay. He said. The dumbest vascular biologist is smarter than the smartest cardiologist. <laughs> I said, I know. I'm an engineer. We're dumber than everyone, but we, <laughs> but we learn. And he said, okay. And together, we embraced on this marvelous journey. And I'm going to fly through a bunch of slides because the content is not important as the disciplines that they embrace. And Dr. Karnofsky taught me how to become a vascular biologist, how to look at the macroscopic and microscopic signals, how to look at the cells and the tissues, how to discover that stents elicited not just clotting but inflammation and proliferation and remodeling. It forced us to understand that we needed to change the way in which we view these devices, because in order to see them. Rather, in order to implant them well, we needed to see them. And if they were made of stainless steel, well, you couldn't see them. So we coated them with gold, and then the gold elicited all those vascular reactions in, in an explosive way. And so 
We talked to metallurgists, then being material scientists, we came up with ways of baking the gold, and we examined how nickel and iron diffuse through the gold to make a much more stable bond. And then, because I'm surrounded by brilliant people, the students helped us understand how computational modeling allowed us to examine some small part of the stent, just one cell of the stent, and look at it and see how the balloon that inflates the stent causes maximal damage to the cells around it. And we developed computational skills that are now part and parcel of every FDA submission for an endovascular implant. Today, when you make a stent, you use these kinds of models that the students envisioned. What you see rotating around you is, in blue, the balloon. In red is an area between one element of the stent, and peeking out from below is what the computer will tell you this design of stent will damage. And what you see in the lower panel on my right is exactly what the histology, what the staining will show you, happens. So now we can make N generations of stent that are progressively more sophisticated designed to optimize the biology. In 1994, one of the seminal studies comparing balloon angioplasty, the inflation of a balloon in an artery to push aside obstructions within the artery, was compared to bypass surgery, definitive surgery that un that where you bypass an obstruction in a coronary. Bypass surgery is actually wonderful. Within a year, fewer than 10 percent of the patients are going to have to come back for something. Fewer than 10 percent are going to suffer a recurrence. And angioplasty is wonderful. You don't have to open someone up, but 40 percent of the time it failed. The introduction of stents that we helped develop and others did as well, that failure rate dropped from 40 to 25 percent. My PhD was actually in drug delivery, and one of the things we did in our laboratory was to dip stents into coatings, coatings that had drug, with the idea of releasing drugs. And other people were pursuing it at the time as well. And by understanding pharmacology and pharmacokinetics and the right use of drugs, and then, interestingly enough, linking with industry, because it's very important. That's what we could do in our lab. That shaggy orange thing is the best we can do in the lab. That's a modern stent, again, in the upper panel on my right. It has a coating two to 10 microns thick on stent struts that are 100 microns in thickness. And when we look on our microscopes, 200 microns deep into an artery, we've been able to imprint drug. So that five years after the stent study, we compare drug-eluting stents to bypass surgery, you now do even better. The failure rate in my lifetime, using Vice President Cheney as our model patient, allowed the failure rate to go from 40 percent to 25 percent to 6 percent. So I never met Jessica. I've never worked with her before. This was my question. Who should get the Nobel Prize? I would posit, with all due respect, that that's not an important question. The important question is, how do we recapitulate this experience? Does it take a symphony? I would posit no. I would posit a symphony is what you do once you've written the music and you want it played precisely, reproducibly, the same way each time. Maybe with a little bit more emotion here and there, but nobody can innovate in a symphony. That's not symphonic music. That's not classic. That's just dissonance. The question is then, do you need a team of experts to do this? Do you need a symphony? Or do you need one or two multidisciplinary thinkers? Now, through the ages, we've identified people as truly monodimensional. Lord Rutherford, Ernst Rutherford, is one of those people. He's quoted as saying, and like most people who's not here to defend themselves, it's not clear that he actually said it, but we'll give him the quote. That which is not measurable is not science. That which is not physics is stamp collecting. The truth is, the Cavendish labs, which he ran, embraced multidisciplinarism. He embraced theoretical physics. He was an empiric physicist. 
but his discovery and identification and definition and characterization of the atom and its nucleus required multiple people to be present. You got called Einstein when I was a kid. That means you were a nerd in the extreme. But the truth is that in one Annus Mirabilis, one miracle year in 1905, in the same journal, Einstein published a paper using particle physics to explain Brownian motion, using particle physics to explain the photoelectric effect, using particle physics to explain uh, special relativity. And today, we use the Bose-Einstein relationship to describe blood viscosity. So here's the paradox. When you think about a discipline and what those are meant to be, a little eyeballs, one in the center, one looking out, one looking in from the periphery, and they're not very far apart when the discipline is new. But when the discipline starts to move, if you sit at the center, you lose sight of the boundaries, and if you're sitting on the boundaries, you lose sight of the center. Now, the energy goes not only as the mass, it goes as the velocity, which means that great disciplines don't just grow, they move. And as they move, they not only move away from where you were, they move away from other great disciplines. So at the end of the day, whether you're in the center of one discipline or another, you're really far apart from where you started. And so the question is, if knowledge is like our universe, and each galaxy is like a node or a discipline. How do we control the explosion of knowledge such as not to lose track of what we think is essential? How do we train people to be scientists, whether they are citizen scientists or classical scientists, when at the end of the day, as knowledge explodes, we're simply moving people farther and farther apart. I actually think it's a slander on human capacity to force people to absorb one discipline. I think it belies the human mind to say that we can only absorb one thing. My heroes are people like Hermann von Helmholtz, who is not only the premier professor of optics of his day, but used his understanding of engineering and science to design the ophthalmoscope that which allows us as physicians to peer into people's bodies and souls. Lord Rutherford, who won the Nobel Prize for the synthesis of penicillin, wrote the seminal paper on the endothelial cell. And with Morris Carnosti, fostered in the whole era of vascular biology. I think, as scientists, we have a moral obligation Moral obligation is not to isolate ourselves and not to be unidimensional. Science is, in isolation, is by its nature selfish. Without community, it's sterile. Medicine without science is just an art form. The trick is to not pay attention to the light, but to pay attention to the dark. The universe is bound by its dark matter, by its dark energy, just as introns we realizing now are just important as exons, we need to focus on the connectivity, not just the nodes. Now, we should have known better. This is the definition of engineering. I can go back to Professor Karnofsky and tell him I was right. The application of science and mathematics with which the properties of matter and the sources of energy and nature are made useful to people. That's who you are as an engineer. And our obligation, our moral obligation, is to bring people together. So at the end of the day, what I would add to this little dictum is a little note, a little note to Lord Rutherford. Science in isolation is selfish, without community sterile. Medicine without science is simply an art form. And engineering is that which benefits people. And without that benefit, and without engineering, science and medicine are just stamp collecting. Thank you.